Hi, AP Biology students. Um, I have your Chapter 3 video lecture notes. Chapter 3 is on carbon and the molecular diversity of life. Remember to take notes as we go through this lecture, but also write down any questions you have so that we can address them when you come to class. So one of the first things that we need to lay the foundation for in this chapter, in this section, is that carbon atoms form diverse molecules by bonding to four other atoms. They have to form four different bonds. And this is because um, carbon has six electrons, two in the inner shell, and then that leaves four valence electrons available for bonding. So that is what allows them to form four different bonds. Um, carbon can is very versatile because of this. So you have a simple structure where um, that carbon might just be bonded to hydrogens, and that would give you methane, CH4. You also could bond to other carbons, and an example here is ethane with two central carbons also still surrounded by hydrogen, C2H6. But the carbon could also form double or triple bonds um, between itself, other carbons, or other molecules in general. So this is um, a basic example of a double bond with some hydrogens formed to it as well, and this is ethene. So you can see that each of these two carbons still has four bonds a double bond to the other carbon and then two hydrogens. Because of this versatility, carbon skeletons can vary um, by four different main ideas or properties. They can have different lengths, they can have different branching, they can have different positions of their double bond, and they can also have the presence of rings. Another chemical term that we need to know about, and that is what an isomer is. An isomer is are compounds with the same number of atoms and the same type of atoms, but they have a different structure, and that different structure is going to lead to different properties of that compound. So here we have the difference at the bottom, the difference between a cis double bond and a trans double bond. And um, this is the same molecule with each showing each of the double bonds. So here's the double bond that we're looking at. Remember that if we don't see the molecule in the bend, then those are carbons. So these, this double bond is connecting two carbons. And the hydrogens that are also off of those carbons are on the same side of the double bonds. A lot of students like to um, say that the cis double bonds are sisters. They're on the same side of the bond. In the trans double bond, again, we have two carbons held together um, by the double bond, the hydrogens are going to be on opposite side, um, and so they have to travel across the double bond to get to each other. They don't really move, but they are on other sides. Another type of isomer is an enantiomer, and these are mirror images of each other, and we frequently see these in biology and biochemistry. Um, the two most common kinds are the D isomer and the L isomer. So this is which side, um, whether something is on the right side or the left side. So here you have glucose in its non-ring form. And you can see looking um, here that we've got our OHs, um, our three main OHs on the right side, on this side, on this side. D isomer and on the left side on the L isomer. We just call them D and L. You find the L isomers um, more frequently in nature, but you do have D isomers as well. All right, so some more chemistry that we need to lay the foundation before we get to our macromolecules, and those are our six major functional groups that uh, we want to focus on for biochemistry. The first one is a hydroxyl group. Um, hydroxyl is uh, oxygen and a hydrogen bonded to the end of a molecule. These are alcohols. Um, the next one we have is a carboxyl group. It's also called a carboxylic acid group, um, and it is a COOH. Um, if you look at the exploded view, though, here, that, um, that O is double bonded um, to the C. You also will have a carbonyl. We really don't focus on um, carbonyls as much, although you see them a lot in sugars. Um, we mostly see them as carboxyl groups. The next group we have is an amine group or amino group, and this is a nitrogen bonded to two 
hydrogens and you can see it um, written in line format like this or the exploded version here. Uh, the next group we have is a sulfahydryl. Um, sometimes sulfahydryls are called thiols and they are hydrophobic. They're the only one of these six um, that are hydrophobic. The next group we have is um, phosphate group. So this is a phosphate ion surrounded by oxygens um, and several, uh, three of them will have um, negative charges with that. Um, Two of them will have negative charges, excuse me. This is not a negative charge. It's showing the bonding to the molecule. Uh, this is often referred to as being an organic phosphate group. And then the last group that we have is the methyl group. This is a carbon surrounded by three hydrogens. We see these very, very frequently on a lot of our molecules that we'll talk about. And um, we can also refer to a compound as being a methylated compound if it has methyl groups. All right, so macromolecules are polymers that are built from monomers. So we start with monomers being the smallest mo um, piece, and then we add two monomers together, and we get um, a, a two-piece polymer, and then you can continue to add monomers to make larger and larger polymers. But you have two different ways of doing this. One, when we add um, the molecules together, this is making the bonds, and this is called condensation or dehydration reaction, condensation reaction or a dehydration reaction. It can also be referred to as an anabolic reaction. We don't typically use the anabolic and the catabolic as much in um, biology, but they are correct terms. So this is when we're building molecules. It's called dehydration or uh, condensation because we're actually releasing water, and I'll show you an animation of this in a few minutes. When we break the molecule, so when we take a polymer and break it down into its monomers, we are breaking the bonds, and this is hydrolysis. So hydrolysis actually is formed from the root words hydro meaning water and lysis meaning splitting. So we actually have to split water in order to break the bonds of the polymer. This can also be referred to as a catabolic reaction, so we're breaking down molecules and is commonly um, seen in digestion. All of these reactions are going to require enzymes, for which we're going to get to a little bit later in um, the unit, and they are biological catalysts, and they are specific for every type of condensation and hydrolysis, meaning every type of polymer for condensation and hydrolysis. All right, let's look at an animation that will show you this in a little bit more detail. A condensation reaction joins two molecules together to form one larger molecule. An enzyme removes a hydroxyl group from one molecule and a hydrogen atom from another, then speeds the formation of a bond between the two molecules at their exposed sites. Typically, the discarded atoms join to form a molecule of water. Hydrolysis is a type of cleavage reaction. It's like condensation in reverse. An enzyme splits the molecule into two parts then attaches a hydroxyl group and a hydrogen group from water to the exposed sites. The result is two smaller molecules. Condensation and hydrolysis are used to put together and break apart many biological molecules. All right. So hopefully that helped make a little visual. We're going to work with these condensation and hydrolysis reactions throughout the year. All right, so now we're going to get into our four macromolecules or polymers. So carbohydrates are our first one, and they serve as our fuel and building material. Carbohydrates are simply sugars. Um, there are some trademarks of sugars. They have a carbonyl group. Um, it does uh, typically show as first as a carboxyl group, and then once we do those condensation reactions, it does form a carbonyl group. There are also multiple hydroxide groups, and almost all of our names for carbohydrates end in O-S-E. Another interesting fact about carbohydrates is they are in a linear form, but when you put a sugar in an aqueous solution, if the the sugar has five or six carbons, they will typically form rings. And they do that because it's more stable structure if they're in an aqueous solution. So here you can see we have the linear form 
um, of this particular sugar. And when we put it into um, water, it's going to form a hexagon ring that can actually go back and forth um, between a hexagon ring and a pentose ring. So there, the simplest sugar is going to be a monosaccharide. And if you break monosaccharide down into its root words, mono means single and saccharide means sugar. If you add two sugar, if you add two monosaccharides together, you get a disaccharide, which is two sugars. Those monosaccharides are going to be joined by a condensation bond with a glycosidic linkage. Um, so there are different types of covalent bonds for each of our macromolecules for any po um, polymers. Um, so there are three main examples of disaccharides that you should be familiar with. One is sucrose, which is a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule added together. Then you have lactose, which is milk sugar, and that is a glucose sugar and a galactose sugar. And then you have maltose, which is, a, uh, is the sugar that's used in um, beer making, and it is a glucose sugar and a glucose sugar. And then you can see our disaccharide down here. These are just, this is maltose, it's two glucose molecules, but the bond between them is going to be called a glycosidic bond. That's just a specific type of covalent bond that forms between two saccharides. All right, so as you continue, if you take that, poly, that disaccharide and you continue to add more and more monosaccharides, you will get a polysaccharide. A polysaccharide can be a few hundred to a few thousand macro monosaccharides long. And you have two main uses of polysaccharides. You have polysaccharides for storage or you have polysaccharides for structure. Um, let's talk about the for storage first. So you have starch and glycogen. Starch is going to be our plant carbohydrate storage and glycogen is going to be our animal carbohydrate storage. Um, they are going to have one four linkages um, using alpha glucose. So that's a particular type of glucose. Um, there are actually two different types of starch. You have amylose, which is an unbranched starch. So it's just a linear, here it's forming some loops, but that's not branching. It's just a linear string of all these glucose molecules hooked together. Amylopectin still has that base um, linear structure unbranched, but there are some branching off to the side. Those branches are formed between a 1-6 bond. And then in glycogen, you can see it's very extensively branched. This is our animal carbohydrate storage, and it is stored, um, glycogen is stored in our livers and in our muscle cells. Fun fact about glycogen is glycogen storage can actually not sustain hum animals, um, particularly in humans. Glycogen stores are depleted in one day, typically. So that's not a long-term storage for us at all. It's That's why we refer to carbohydrates as our short-term energy storage, because for animals, we deplete that glycogen storage every day. Polysaccharides can also be used for structure, and your main polysaccharide for structure is cellulose, which is the main component in plant cell walls. They have unbranched 1-4 um, linkages between what's called an alpha glucose and a beta glucose, and these are like the D and the L form. They're very similar, and they are um, alternating. And it looks like, so here's an example of, here's the chemical structure of cellulose. The 1,4 means that we're between the 1 and the 4 carbon um, in the molecule. So you would always start with the oxygen, and here's our 1, and then here's our oxygen, 1, 2, 3, 4. So this is a bond between the 1 and the 4 carbon. But if you look, see this would be the alpha glucose, and then this one looks the exact same, but you see this side chain up here is down below, and then these hydroxyl and hydrogen are up at the top. So these are, they almost look like they're right side up and upside down alternating. Um, this structure allows for very compact packing of the cellulose, which gives our plant cell walls um, rigidity. All right, our next group of, of macromolecules is lipids. Lipids are a very diverse group of hydrophobic molecules. We're going to talk about three main types of lipids. We're going to talk about fats, 
phospholipids and steroids. Our fats are made from glycerols and fatty acids that have been joined together through a condensation reaction, forming an ester linkage. Um, and your main type of fat that we, tip, we focus on in biology is a triglyceride. So that is one glycerol with three fatty acids. Your fatty acids come in two different forms, though. You can have a saturated fatty acid or an unsaturated fatty acid. A saturated fatty acid has single bonds only. They are solid. Saturated fatty acid has single bonds only. They are solid at room temperatures, and they those are found in animal fats. An unsaturated fatty acid has one or more double bonds. They are liquid at room temperature, and these are typically our plant and fish fats. And remember back to our um, cis and our trans bonds. We naturally see these as cis bonds, and that cis bond is going to create a kink in our fatty acid chain. So here you have two examples, and you can see we have no double bonds between the carbons. We do have a carboxyl here at the end, but this double bond is not, um, does not make it an unsaturated fatty acid. It has to be between two carbons. Here we do have an unsaturated fatty acid because we have that double bond in the middle. And remember, uh, it is a cis double bond because those hydrogens are on the same side. Now you have a couple exceptions to these rules. Um, we humans have started um, manipulating our fatty acids. And you can have a hydrogenated vegetable oil. So these are unsaturated fats that have extra hydrogens added to get them to solidify. And these are typically trans fats. So they have trans double bonds. They're commonly used in baked goods and processed foods, and they can contribute to coronary heart disease. So we have started requiring um, the usage of whether our fats are trans unsaturated fatty acids be included on our labels of products. And we typically just abbreviate that as saying trans fats, but it has to do with the trans unsaturated double bond um, in the fatty acid. All right, the next group of lipids that we're going to talk about is a phospholipid. We talked about a lot about this when in your introductory biology class um, earlier in high school. They are two fatty acids, um, and they could be both saturated. They could be saturated or unsaturated. Here in this example, I have a saturated and an unsaturated forming that kink. Um, fatty acids that are attached to a glycerol. So here's our glycerol structure and then a phosphate group on top. And that phosphate group and glycerol are going to form what's called the hydrophilic head of the fatty acid. And then the tail part, the um, excuse me, of the phospholipid. And then the fatty acids are going to form the hydrophobic tails. You also remember back to our carbon um, discussion at the beginning of the lecture, I mentioned the term hydrocarbons. Fatty acid tails um, are hydrocarbons because all that's all that's left of this hydrophobic part is just carbons and hydrogens that are bond together. Um, when phospholipids are placed in warm water, they will self-assemble themselves to form bilayers. So this is a precursor of how we got to our first cell with a cell membrane. The third group of lipids that we're going to talk about today is a steroid. This is a carbon skeleton of four fused rings. You can see the ring structure here. The rings can be hexagons like these three or pentagons. Um, it doesn't matter, but they're all four. There's four clearly um, indicated rings. Our main example of steroids that we're in um, responsible for knowing and for going to be very familiar with as we go through the year is cholesterol. And that's because this is the main component or a component in cell membranes, but it's also a precursor to hormones. All right, so now let's talk about proteins. Um, proteins include a diversity of structures and that results in a wide range of functions. So we have eight main functions for proteins. We first have enzymatic proteins, so these are the selective acceleration of chemical reactions, so enzymes, digestive enzymes that catalyze the hydrolysis of food. All right, the next type of proteins that we're going to talk about is a defensive protein, so these are proteins in your body that protect you against disease, and your main example of this are going to be your antibodies. 
All right, then third type is storage proteins. These are proteins that help store amino acids. Um, your two most common examples are casein, which is found in is the protein found in milk, and ovobubin, um, which is the protein found in egg whites. Your fourth type of function of proteins is transport proteins. These transport a substance. They could be, um, an example would be hemoglobin, which transports oxygen from your lungs to the various parts of your body. But you also have um, transport proteins within the cell membrane that are simply going to move molecules in and out of the cell. You have hormonal proteins. These are uh, proteins that coordinate the activities inside of your body. An example would be insulin. That's a protein that helps to decrease your blood sugar or the sugar that's in your blood. You have receptor proteins. Receptor proteins are going to be proteins on the outside of a cell wall and these, or excuse me, outside of a part of a cell membrane, and they are going to um, respond, uh, allow the cell to respond to a chemical signal. And a really good example of this is you have receptors on your nerve cells that will detect nearby neuro neurotransmitters and thus stimulate an action potential or um, a message to travel through your nerves. The seventh type is a contractile or motor protein. Uh, the most common uh, use of this is for movement of organisms themselves. So it could be like flagella um, or scylla, but also within your muscles. Um, you have two different um, contractile um, proteins, actin and myosin, that will help you contract your muscles so that you can move. But it could also um, be a smaller protein within a cell that will help move vesicles. And a really good example of this is a motor protein called kinesin. And the last major function of proteins is a structural, uh, structural protein. And structural proteins form support so keratin is a really good example of this. We have our nails and our hair is made of keratin, um, but also porcupine quills are made of keratin. Um, so that is support and protection for the porcupine. Um, silk fibers from um, for spiders, collagen and elastin that are found in our bodies to help um, help support our skin. Excuse me. All right, so proteins are pretty complicated, but all the proteins in all the world are all constructed from the same 20 amino acids, and they are linked together in unbranched polymer chains by peptide bonds. So let's first talk about the simple structure of an amino acid. So an amino acid has a central carbon, sometimes referred to as the alpha carbon. So that's here, the black carbon in the middle. And off of the central carbon or alpha carbon, you have an amino group highlighted in blue. You have a, a side chain, which is frequently referred to or represented by the letter R if you're looking at a generic amino acid structure. Or, a, a, not or, <laughs> next you have a carboxyl group. And remember, carboxyl groups are also known as carboxylic acid groups. And then on the opposite side of your side chain, you have a hydrogen. So when you look at the structure, it's really um, evident why we call them amino acids. Amino for the amine group and acid for the carboxylic acid group. Your R, R groups are um, found in four different types of categories. You have hydrophobic R groups, hydrophilic R groups, acidic R groups, and basic R groups. Now, when you take two um, amino acids and join them together through the condensation reaction, you're going to get a dipeptide or two, peptide, um, two amino acids with a peptide bond in the middle. Um, so what's, And then you would continue to do that to form a polypeptide. A lot of students get really confused between the difference between a polypeptide and a protein. So a polypeptide is just the simple polymer of amino acids. I like to think about it as almost a... Um, a pearl necklace, okay? And then a protein is a biologically functional molecule. So it's if you took that pearl necklace and turned it into a smaller structure by twisting it and then putting some clips between it. And here you can see um, our amino acids, our individual amino acids. We get to the peptide part, the polypeptide, 
by stringing them together through those peptide bonds, through condensation reactions. And then the protein itself, there's actually um, several steps you go through to get to a complicated protein. And proteins can be globular or fibrous, and that is exactly what it sounds like. Globular would be a glob-like shape, and fibrous would be a long fiber-like shape. Most of the proteins that we're going to talk about throughout the year are going to be globular proteins. All right, there are four different levels of protein structure that amino acids and proteins will go through to become a fully functioning protein at the end. The first one is our primary structure, which is typically indicated um, by a one with a little circle or degree mark next to it. This is just simply the linear chain of amino acids, the polypeptide chain. It does have an N terminus and a C terminus. The N terminus is the end that has the amino group, and the C terminus is the end that has the carboxylic acid group. The next um, structure is secondary structure, and these it, this is when our polypeptide chain has regions that are stabled by hydrogen bonds between the atoms of the polypeptide backbone. There are two main types of secondary structure. There's an alpha helix, um, abbreviated with the Greek lowercase alpha, um, and that is when the polypeptide chain is in a coil formation, and that is held together by hydrogen bonds between every fourth amino acid. But you could also have a beta pleated sheet formation um, abbreviated by the Greek beta letter. And this is when two or more sections of the protein or polypeptide lie side by side and are then connected by hydrogen bonds between the amine and the carboxyl group. Tertiary structure is the next structure. This is where we start to get our three-dimensional shape, whether it's going to be a globular shape or a fiber, fibrous shape. And this is that shape is stabilized between interactions between the side chains. So in secondary structure, you were in primary structure, we're focusing on just those amine and carboxyl groups. Um, but now we're looking at integrating those R groups. And so you have hydrophobic interactions. So those hydrophobic R groups are going to fold away from the water um, that or aqueous solution that our protein is in. You have disulfide bridges that form between two sulfahedral groups. So sulfahedral means, of course, that they have sulfur. So there's a disulfide, two sulfide, sulfurs that form a bridge, which is a special covalent bond between those two sulfahedral groups. You have ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are typically also called salt bridges when we're talking about proteins, and they're just um, bonds between the positive and the negatively charged uh, R groups. And then last, you have hydrogen bonds, and these are interactions between polar groups or hydrophilic reactions, so they will um, turn away towards the water and away from the hydrophobic and protect those hydrophobic places in the middle. And the last structure is quaternary structure. This is when we have two or more completely different polypeptide chains joining together, bonding together to form a working um, much larger, much more complicated protein. This is not all proteins. Um, hemoglobin is a really good example of this because it actually, its quaternary structure is four different polypeptide chains um, and their tertiary structure interacting um, to form a much larger complex molecule. So denaturation, what it is, is the changing of the structure of a protein so that the protein cannot carry out its function. We typically focus on denaturation with enzymes, but any protein, because all enzymes are proteins, um, but any protein can be denatured. High temperatures will cause denaturation um, because the, the high temperatures will cause uh, the molecules to have extra energy. That extra energy will lead to increased vibrations, and that will break the intramolecular bonds that's holding them together in either the primary or the secondary um, structure. Changes in pH can also cause denaturation because any hydrogen bond is going to be affected and broken. So um, any hydrogen bond, whether it's in that secondary or tertiary or even quaternary structure, um, is subject to changes in pH. And then both of these methods are going to result the changes in the pH or the temperatures in altered three-dimensional structures of the protein um, and in an enzyme that would be an active site. And denaturation is completely irreversible. 
So let's uh, go and watch this little video that summarizes this. This familiar gelatin dessert actually is a good example of the process of coagulation of proteins into a three-dimensional latticework that entraps water molecules to produce a semi-solid gel. This animation explains the physical chemistry behind the process. Proteins are synthesized by polymerizing amino acids. The polymerization occurs by repeatedly forming peptide bonds that link individual amino acids together into a chain. There are three structural features that influence the three-dimensional shape of a water-soluble protein. Primary structure is the peptide bond between individual amino acids that creates a long chain of connected amino acids. These long chains of polymerized amino acids have hydrophobic, water-repelling, and hydrophilic, water-attracting projections that are oriented perpendicular to the chain, as shown in this illustration of a growing protein chain. Secondary structure is the helix that the protein chain curls into as a result of hydrogen bonds and other weak forces. Tertiary structure is created when the protein molecules fold back on themselves outside of the helical segments to put the hydrophobic portions to the interior and the hydrophilic portions to the exterior. Several helical regions can exist in different portions of the molecule. When the protein has folded and refolded to reach its most stable configuration, it will have mostly hydrophilic amino acid residues on the exterior and mostly hydrophobic residues directed into the interior. When natural proteins are subjected to physical or chemical treatment, their structure changes and they become unnative or unnatural. We call that process denaturation. In this example, heating the proteins in solution imparts energy to the protein molecules. This added energy is enough to break the relatively weak forces that hold the protein in its refolded and helical tertiary and secondary configurations. As the process of denaturation proceeds, the protein molecule unfolds more and more, and the internally directed hydrophobic regions now become exposed on the outside of the molecule. The peptide bonds are largely hydrophilic. Once these segments are set free from each other, they attract water molecules. The recruitment of water molecules entraps the water molecules in close proximity to the protein strands. The hydrophobic portions of the molecules are also exposed. This situation is unfavored because the hydrophobic portions of molecules are not stable in an aqueous environment. Hence, upon unfolding, the hydrophobic regions on individual protein molecules will associate with hydrophobic regions on other protein molecules. This situation encourages the association of these protein molecules into larger and larger random three-dimensional structures. The molecules aggregate into very large, water-insoluble collections that are quite randomly assembled. As the proteins denature, latticework structures grow amorphously and attract the solvent water molecules into cell-like structures. The self-associated water molecules, in groups, adhere to the surface of hydrophilic regions of the protein, while hydrophobic regions of the protein dissolve into each other and provide the energy to retain the structure. As this process continues irreversibly, all of the protein molecules are recruited to this large and soluble mass in a randomly organized structural framework that contains entrapped water molecules. One example of the consequences of unfolding and reassociating protein molecules is coagulation of egg white. Frying an egg is no more complicated than denaturing the egg white protein. The assembly of irreversibly denatured protein molecules results in formation of a solid gel. The gel entraps water molecules inside the white into a semi-solid structure which holds its shape under normal conditions. Other examples of denatured protein assembling into three-dimensional structures include the baking of yeast-risen bread, coagulation of meat proteins by cooking in such products as hot dogs, and in the solidification of gelatin upon cooling of a solution. Denaturation and coagulation of proteins is a complex, irreversible process. 
But the study of denaturation has allowed us to better understand the three-dimensional structure of native proteins. All right, so now let's look at the difference between the fibrous and the globular proteins. Um, so fibrous, you can see here, there's little or no tertiary structure. It's mostly alpha helices or beta pleated sheets. Um, there's long parallel uh, polypeptide chains. Um, really, I just want you to know visually what's the difference here. Your two um, really good examples are keratin and collagen. So um, keratin in the hair and the outer layer of your skin and collagen is our connective um, tissue. Um, and then globular, like I said earlier, is almost everything that we're going to talk about throughout the year. This is a complex tertiary structure. It's folded into a spherical globular shape and some will have quaternary structure as well. All right, so the last section um, that we have to talk about or our last macromolecule is nucleic acids. And of course, nucleic acids store, transmit, and help express our heredity. And we have kind of a flow that moves through these. So our smallest monomer is our nucleotides. They're going to join together to form nucleic acids. We have two different types of nucleic acids. And then um, one of our nucleic acids um, DNA uh, is storing our heredity information and then uh, that forms our genes. So looking at our nucleotides, we have three basic pieces of a nucleotide. You have a nitrogenous base and we'll get to more of this when we get into our actual DNA structure. Just want to go over some basics now. You have a sugar in the case of uh, DNA, it's deoxyribose sugar. In the case of RNA, it's ribose sugar and then you have a phosphate group. So this phosphate group is always present no matter if it's an RNA nucleotide or a DNA nucleotide. Already talked about the difference in the sugar between the RNA and the DNA. And then the nitrogenous bases, three of them are the same. So the A's, the G's, and the C's, adenosine, guanine, and cytosine are the same no matter if it's RNA or DNA. But then you have um, a different form. You have either uracil or thiamine if it's RNA versus uh, DNA. RNA nucleic acids are single-stranded, and DNA nucleic acids are double-stranded. And, of course, our DNA stores our heredity information, and our RNA is going to be used to make our proteins from our genetic information from our DNA. All right, so three last definitions. Um, and this is the last section of the textbook talks about genomics and proteomics. So uh, both genomics and proteomics have transformed biological inquiry and applications. Genomics are an approach that analyzes large sets of genes or the whole genome um, or all of genomics. Um, the proteomics are a similar approach for a large set of proteins. So you're looking at the proteins within the body or within an organism. And then bioinformatics are the use of computational tools and computer software to analyze large sets of data. All right, so that's it for today's lecture. Um, please remember to bring your notes, but also your questions to class so that I can clear up any misconceptions. Thanks so much, guys.